record this. Oh, All right. Great job, everyone. So I know it's a small thing, but we really do appreciate you. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you. We wouldn't be the place we are without you, seriously. So we, well, we actually have to thank P Street for this. This, this was the P Street idea. And the, the other idea from P Street was uh, from uh, our president here, Donneris, with his, his uh, talk today is uh, for a postdoc presentation that's going to go out actually web streaming to all the other departments within the institution. This is a trend that I, I hope we can keep going. Uh, the postdoc program uh, on our campus uh, has done such a good job that uh, we're sought after even on the West Coast. <laughs> and uh, we're honored at the, the, right. the first opportunity to have this uh, general broadcast by having Matt Scott uh, talk to you about how to give a good talk and finding and keeping a job. All, your All right. Thanks, Rick. It's great to be, be here. Of course, I'm honored uh, to be invited and to be here for this little celebration of our main workforce in the Carnegie Institution. The funny thing, of course, about giving a talk about how to give a good talk is you're almost guaranteed to embarrass yourself. Because <laughs> everybody can go away and say, who is he to talk about this? And so one of the things to say is that talks are always a matter of personal style. And you want to let that personal style influence your talk. But as you all know, having all of you who have sat through many talks that you either dreaded in advance or moaned about during or whatever. And so you've seen plenty of cases where someone whose science was wonderful was presented in a way that made it uh, less than terrific. So we want to think about what, what is the motivation? Why should you even care about putting a lot of effort into giving talks? And how do you go about thinking about giving good talks? So, and then many of you are now or will be looking for various kinds of jobs, and there are all sorts of different jobs. Uh, I don't know any jobs where it isn't useful to be able to speak well about your ideas, your plans, your accomplishments, or whatever. So, I would claim that good speaking is valuable in most jobs and essential in some. If teaching is a major part of your effort, you have to be able to give good talks. Most people find that giving good talks, organizing your thoughts, which is a little bit like writing a grant application, it forces you to be coherent, or it should. So there's the thought that good speaking comes from clear thinking, that it is an occasion to think maybe from a different perspective about your work. This is why I actually think teaching is a terrific kind of experience, because you're explaining yourself not to specialists who have already bought into what you think is important, but to people who you're trying to persuade about the fascination of your work, the excitement of your work, the potential of your work. And this turns around because as people listen to you, they will say and think, good speaking is taken as an indicator that you're capable of clear thinking. It's a test, and it's a test that is always there. You were judging me today. You can't help yourself, so it's scary for me. And another way of putting the point is that every talk you ever give is a job talk. You have no idea talking at your local journal club, which of the people in the room may years later, perhaps decades later, have an important influence on your opportunities for grants, for jobs, for collaborations, whatever. So you want to treat every chance you have to give a talk as an opportunity to try to do something better, try to do something special, try to do something distinctive, because you never know when that flash of inspiration or enjoyment or pleasure will in fact get someone thinking, you know, we really should recruit this person for whatever it is down the line. In contrast, if you come half prepared with illegible slides and a confusing message, 
that too will make a lasting impression, which you then have to overcome. So it's best to use every chance you have to give a talk as a practice opportunity where you'll try maybe some experiments in what works for you about giving a talk. So what you want to do, therefore, is when you give a talk, you want to prepare in a serious manner for that talk. Of course, some talks are more crucial than others, but the more you prepare, the more you're going to discover for yourself things that work for you and ideas about how to do better. If the talk has any importance beyond the standard one, you want to do practice talks to people who will give you critical feedback about what worked for them, what didn't work for them. You want to include people among your friends who listen, who are not specialists in your area. You want to say, did I reach you? Because it's never good practice to give a pure specialist talk. Any talk you ever give, including to people who are right in your field, you always have an introduction first that lays out why this matters to you, why it matters to the world, what the importance of the work is. Never, ever skip that step because it puts the whole talk in context. And even the people who buy into it are sitting there smugly saying, yes, this is a fabulous field and I'm in it. So they, they enjoy it. But there will always be people there who want, will want to understand your own personal perspective on what is it that you find exciting. This is about motivation and conveying excitement. Then you want to work hard in the talk. There should be lots of revisions, lots of trying this, trying that. How can I make this better? Okay, and I'll show you an example of playing around in a moment. And you can pretend to yourself that that particular talk in that particular day will in fact determine whether you get the job you've been dreaming of. And that, of course, is perfectly plausible. That's how things happen. People in positions of recruitment are always keeping their eyes open for somebody down the line who will either be recommended for an institution they're associated with so their buddy calls him up and says, Sue, I heard, you know, we have this opening. We just found out there's this new professorship. We're looking for somebody straight out of their postdoc. Can you tell us somebody from Carnegie, for example? Well, who is that person going to mention and why? And how will that person feel about you representing the kind of excitement, the kind of quality, the kind of speaking ability, the kind of teaching ability that means they deserve that job? be very proud of recommending that person, okay? And that can apply to everybody, okay? So it's not a, a zero-sum game. In other words, if all of you work at giving magnificent presentations, all of you will qualify for those kinds of personal recommendations, not at someone else's expense. So what's the situation? Typically, by the time you've gone through graduate school, and a postdoc for some number of years, you've worked very hard. And you're doing tasks that are not the only tasks that matter for getting a job. In other words, they're necessary but not sufficient. Because the sufficiency includes the persuasion process, the excitement process, the inspiration process where you convince a group, whether it be in industry or in academia, startups, government organizations, you have to get a bunch of people who probably disagree with each other on a lot of things to choose you as the best person who maximally matches up with your spectrum of skills. And you've learned a lot. You have knowledge that's usually, if you've been educating yourself way, well in a sort of interdisciplinary way so that you combine skills that are represented in multiple advisors, multiple colleagues, and they all become part of you, then you are unique, and you have a mixture of skills that no one else has, and uniqueness, distinctiveness in work and in skill sets is often an important path because different people on the search committee, whatever kind of search committee it is, will each see somebody they can relate to. So the person's very good with a mass spec, but they think a lot about microscopy, you know, or whatever it is. Okay. And generally, you've made some scientific discoveries that you have to package in your talk to
to reach the audience. You really want to be thinking about who is in your audience and what they care about. And that means if you're visiting a department that has 10 faculty in it, and faculty are typically quite diverse, then you want to look at their web pages, you want to study what their interests are, and in the interview process you want to look for opportunities to say, well, you know, I've got this side project I didn't tell you about my main talk, and I'd really love your advice on this. And suddenly they find somebody they can relate to who they thought wasn't very interested in their work or was in another field or whatever. So you want to look for ways to connect either your primary work or other things you've done or will do or plan to do with each of the people you meet with. And indeed, in your talk, you think very hard about who's sitting there. And you don't speak to the one or two experts in the room who are in your own field. That's not the primary audience. It's a subset of the audience. You are trying to demonstrate you can get a whole group of diverse scientists excited about what you do. Another prior state, hopefully, is you've actually decided you really love doing science. And it's really hard. And you know how hard it is. And you want to keep doing it. Which is, in my view, a privilege. I mean, I've been lucky. I got to do that. It's a privilege. It's hard. It's competitive. But it also has tremendous freedoms. So you have to with all this is preamble, you have to talk somebody into hiring you, right? That's the game. You want to be the missing piece in their brain that they finally found. So they come out of your talk saying, wow, that is so, can you imagine having so-and-so down the hall working on whatever it is, right? And therefore, you have to provide the answer. The responsibility is upon you. They invited you, let's say you got that far, but why should they want to hire you? What are they looking for? Is it just papers you've published? No, it's certainly not just papers you've published. And it's the prospect of an exciting future, most of all. So presumably, you've demonstrated that you can produce science, important science. That, that's what we've got you in the room. But then you have to persuade them that they want you. And why might they want you? Well, first of all, and this may seem a little peculiar, they actually want a friend. If you're working at a business or you're working in an de academic department or a government agency or something, they'd like to have somebody around they'll enjoy working with. And so being friendly and curious, interested, connecting with them personally makes an enormous difference in the interview process. During the talk, in the private interviews, at the meals, you, and all of you know, I'm sure, that the moment you get off the plane and meet somebody at the airport who's taking you to the whatever, you are being interviewed. Every minute you are being watched, everything you do will be reported. So going back to the airport at the end of the day and saying, boy, that, that guy Charlie was really weird, you know. <laughs> it's over, okay? It's over. That'll spread through, you know, all the people who hate Charlie will spread that. And, you know, so you really have to be careful that you're on the spot all day long. They want a colleague. Obviously, they want somebody who's likely to connect in some way working together, whether it be for scientific projects or it be for teaching or committee work. Nothing's more deadly than sitting in committee meetings. If you have somebody who has the same sense of humor, or at least something, or some sense of humor that will be shared, that's good. They want a collaborator, so if there's a potential for scientific collaboration, Who's going to point that out? You're going to wait for them to figure it out, or are you going to point it out to them? Don't leave things implicit. And if there's politics involved, and I emphasize there's almost never politics involved in academia or businesses, uh, they want a co-conspirator. They want somebody who they think, and you want to convince all of them they think this, you're going to be on their side in pushing for an expansion in the field you both care about or something like that. So. So all of that is true. And then the other piece of it is, you know, there might be a number of people who fit the bill. So they're going to be looking at you in all of these ways. So you're going to be friendly. You're going to be collegial. You've done some really cool science. You don't wait for them to figure it out. You don't leave it implicit. You show your excitement. You show your energy. You convince them that not the reason you've succeeded so far is that you're kind of person who 
tends to attract good people to work together, tends to be very bold about trying new methods, You're not shy about leaping into something and pushing really hard. All those kinds of things are signs of a kind of entrepreneurial scientific energy that is very, very important. And then as we'll talk about some more in a moment, you explain your science beautifully. It should be beautiful. It is beautiful in your head, and that's not enough. It has to be beautiful in the presentation. It has to be beautiful when you sit down to, in a cafeteria to tell somebody why you do what you do, what you're doing, what you think the prospects are. There's plenty of beauty there, but you have to be the transmitter of that beauty. You have to explain to them how you provide fresh strength to the business, department, agency, team, whatever. What are you going to bring there? Again, doing a lot to study the people who are interviewing you, to find out what they care about, what missing gaps there might be. In a university setting, you might say, well, really, you should be teaching this course in such and such. And I can teach that course, and here's why it's so important that that kind of new course be taught. And suddenly you have a role to play, a niche to be in. And this actually ties into something we'll get to a little more later, which is about keeping the job. In an academic setting, that would mean tr working toward tenure. In a non-academic setting, it would be maintaining your importance in the organization without that kind of uh, appointment. But what is your role? What is, how do you fit in? How, are, how do you become essential? So for example, if you're the person who runs the electron microscope facility fabulously and everyone shares that it's use, that's a very good kind of service that contributes to everyone appreciating you. Or you're good at graduate admissions. Or you bring a technological expertise, perhaps computational science, and you team up with a lot of people to help them apply methods they haven't used before, whatever it might be. And the final point on this list is you care and you show you care about their work. Every time you sit down with somebody, you ask them about their work, you ask them to explain their work, you comment about how interesting it is. You've already done your homework, so you pretty much know at least some of what they're going to tell you. They may be working on new things, but you've already thought about it and looked for connections and so on. One of the most standard errors in job interviews is to sit for 30 to 45 minutes with a scientist and talk about your own work for the whole time in response to their questions. They're very interested in your work. And you never ask them about their work. That's a fatal error. I've seen it many times. We're in the faculty meeting that follows, and I'm sure it's the same in business. I say, you know, we talk for all this time. The guy never even asks me about what I'm doing. I mean, it's insulting, it hurts personally, and it certainly shows that the likelihood of you being an interesting colleague for that person in the future is very small. If they can't, under a job interview context, be curious about the work. Think what it'll be like when they're busy with their own work. And, you know, so that doesn't work at all. They also want to see confidence and a likelihood of success. Again, there are only so many arguments you can make predicting the future, but if you don't make them, who's going to make them for you? If you're very lucky, you might have an advocate at the company, at the agency, at the college, but you really should lay out why you think something is your approach is going to work. You know, this thing is really taking off. It should be the feeling of this. The way I do this is special. The way I do this is certain to succeed to this extent, and we're going to really go for it. We hope it also succeeds in this other way. And here's why I think it will. Right? Again, don't leave it implicit. Don't hope that they figure it out. This is no time to be overly modest let alone arrogant, where you give the impression of, well, how could you not appreciate the wonders I've told you? You know, that is not a good approach for most people, okay? So, very important. Now, um, what is a common thing that happens, and I've, 
So I've spent 30 years in academia. That's what I know best, but I've had a number of, I've, I've had 55 postdocs or something working my lab over the years, and they've gotten jobs in a number of different things. One is a patent lawyer now, other people went to biotech, and so on. So I've had some exposure, but of course I know academia much better. And one of the things that's so sad, and I alluded to it already, in one hour, you can convince them not to hire you. You've spent how many years? And it's over in one hour from a bad talk. That's crazy, right? And it's totally unnecessary. And usually it's because of bad advisors. But not totally because you have a responsibility to get the help you need. And if somebody isn't giving it to you, it's your problem, definitely and you want to find somebody else to give it to you, okay? Because not all advisors provide adequate guidance about job hunts and all that stuff. And even if they do, even if you have a terrific advisor who works very hard for you, it's still beneficial to get additional advice from others, many of whom have many years of experience, because this is what you really, really want to avoid. So this business of years of preparation and it's over in an hour. Because you give an incoherent talk, because you don't explain the importance of what you're doing, because you give a job seminar that sounds like a research seminar. Those are totally different things. Right? In a research seminar, you're not talking about what you'll be doing in five or ten years. You're not talking about how you'll contribute to the department. This has nothing to do with a research seminar or a conference talk. You have to structure the talk in a very different way. So, do not make this mistake. Now, we'll talk about presentation stuff next. I want to leave time for you to ask me what you want to hear about, because I'm taking a risk by telling you some things I hope are of some use to you. So the first thing I just want to mention is that we are living in the 2000 teens, and we do not, we should not be producing slides that look like typewritten 1940s, you know, Kodak images. So having slides that in Helvetica font, black and white like this. Now, some of you may totally disagree with the kinds of things I'm about to say. Uh, I am not very artistic, but I do like to have visually striking things. Other people see an elegance in having very crisp, simple things like this, black and white, simple fonts, no decoration, nothing. You can do that. You can get away with that. And indeed, I've known some speakers who gave fantastic, very complex genetics talks where they distilled it to a few simple icons and things that explained something so beautifully and cleanly. There was an elegance and a style to the starkness and the sparseness of the slides. And if that's what you're after and can do it, fabulous. I'm all for it. For most people and for most topics, that doesn't take adequate advantage of the full kind of beauty. Okay, so if you're a mathematician, there's a kind of, or some sorts of physics, there's a purity and excellence of this kind of approach. But for much of the science done by you, there's lots of other beauty there. And discarding it seems like an unnecessary loss. Okay. Also, choosing titles. This is a title, Studies of a Supernova. Well, it says virtually nothing. Uh, you have no idea if the person's left their imprint here or where it's going or something like this. Another one would be for the same talk, the supernova G5TN reflects the partial sets in principle in two ways. Okay, So you've already lost 90% of your audience who have no idea what that principle is, partly because I made it up. And the two ways aren't described. Nothing is explained. And it's repulsive, literally repulsive. It drives people away from curiosity. It says nothing about the importance. It says nothing. Okay, so let's try something else. I think this is better. Supernova is Phoenix, death of a star and element generation. Okay, so 
that lacks specificity, but you're going to give them plenty of specificity, and at least it creates some sense of drama and a little classical illusion, right? So now we have our classical illusion, so I can say, okay, well, let's dress it up. So what about adding to this uh, something like this, okay? So not a bad representation of a supernova kind of effect, but, and so it's good because we have visual memory. We are humans, and there are large parts of our brain devoted to visual memory. No one can resist that unless they're visually impaired. But if they aren't, and you want to speak to them, of course, well, too. But if they aren't, they can't help starting to remember things that are either very visual or very funny, because nobody can resist them. Good. Right. And you should not hesitate to put some humor into your slides, okay? I think. But why do something that has really only metaphoric relations when you have images like this that you can steal liberally, even if they aren't your own, and use them to celebrate the magnificence, Crab Nebula, the magnificence of what you're thinking about, right? Just stunning. Okay, let's keep dressing this up. You may not notice, but I already fixed the font. I got rid of the Helvetica. I got rid of the black and white. Try to have some personal style. Whatever your taste is, impose some personal style so it's not a generic, plain vanilla talk. Okay, so this will look better, it seems to me, with a black background over part of the slide. And here's the person giving the talk. That's not me, as you might have gathered, but, you know, you put your name up there. That's not perfect because she's too small, so make her bigger and take out the background around her so she blends into the celestial sky. And we're starting to get somewhere here, This bringing this talk to life a little bit, because half the people are falling asleep in the audience, don't remember where she's from, don't remember her name, don't remember that she's got a doctorate, or whatever the title is, right? So again, trying to be crystal clear and visually striking. Okay, but let's animate it a little bit, you know, so she can appear after you say something about her supernova, and then let's make this more fun, so let's have the supernova appear before she appears, and then finally, you know, again, deciding what you want to have, okay? So, I've done lots of teaching of medical students who are fairly unbearable to teach. And I've done it for 25 years. And they have a low tolerance for stuff like this, you would think. Uh, and it turns out when I got my evaluations back, which I'm happy to say were pretty good for the course I taught on development in medicine, that the major comment was I use music well in my talks. From, from 80 first year Stanford medical students who were a bunch of hard asses who were hard, uh, you know, condescending to come to class as a major sacrifice on their part. Okay? So this was, it taught me a lesson though, the same things that worked when I taught freshmen, which is incorporating the Grateful Dead or you know, pick your, your various things that worked into talks were surprising. It would as it did for you, you're sort of going, oh, you know, it sets you back a little, woke you up, you're engaged with me, you're either laughing with me or at me, I don't care, I'll take you to one of those. Okay? And so you can think about these things. Some things work, some things don't work, but gimmicks work. I was once told by someone expert that he talked to trip over a wastebasket in the front from time to time during the time. Everybody's instantly paying attention again. You know, there are all sorts of things. You also probably know the trick that I'm using right now, which is you want to make eye contact with your audience. So you think audience how to do that. Just over a bit, just over your head. And everybody in the beat of your book is a little bit of maybe your own that actually works. Okay? Do it right now. Uh, the other thing that can help you if you're all nervous, which I always am in giving talks, you look for somebody, please, who's smiling or even laughing. And maybe you're smiling at something they're reading on their phone, but it doesn't matter. 
just looking at her face makes me feel like at least you know, there's some hope. <laughs> and so this versus this, you go to this, and I would argue that for me, <laughs> this is better. Okay? And from slide one, which this is, you, you're sending a message that you're willing to take a little risk, that you care, that you've done something a little distinctive, that they can expect to see other visually striking, maybe even auditory surprises, and that you're taking advantage of what's out there in terms of both still and potentially video imagery that can enhance the clarity of your talk and at the same time dress it up so that people go out there saying, God, that was beautiful. You know, the ideas were beautiful and the images were beautiful. What are you trying to do? They're interviewing six other people. How are you going to beat them? You've got to think about these things, right? Clarity, simplicity, the sweep of the talk, the organization of the talk, the contact with the audience, the feeling that you care about them, the beauty of the images or sound, or whatever it is, and the excitement you convey about the potential for your scientific future, which is part of this. And some of this stuff, showing things like this, relaxes you and the whole room. It's a little goofy, but that helps. And then the energy, then you start getting some back and forth connection with your audience that starts to feel like you're not alone up here anymore. You're exploring an interesting scientific story together rather than I'm standing here frozen with fear while you sit there stony faced wishing you could be sleeping somewhere else, right? So how do you get past that? So one way to destroy talks is with slides like this, okay, the title's appropriate, the quote is beautiful but you can't read it, it's endless text. And what the heck is that doing up there? PowerPoint things with bullet points? Just deadly. If you have to show something, show it so you can read it. This is the first paragraph of that. You could split up the thing into other paragraphs and title it with something that this is John Steinbeck from the Log of the Sea of Cortez. It's a beautiful quote, but the point is you've got to make things big font and legible, and people who've worked in my lab know that I always sat down with every person after every talk they ever gave, we went through every slide, and I gave detailed reactions to the clarity and interest of the slides, as well as to the quality of science they had presented. Another common mistake, very much along the same lines, is you have a nice published paper on the topic you're talking about, it has beautiful figures, it's published in a famous journal, and you show something that looks like this which is straight out of the paper. And it's all there, as you can see. You've probably already figured out exactly what that's about. It's from one of my papers, okay? And you can highlight the really important part, which is that little peak right there, okay? There it is for all to see. In a one hour talk, let alone a 45 minute talk, let alone a 35 minute talk that leaves you time to talk about your plans, you're not trying to convince people of all your controls and all your experiments and all these details, they can ask about them later, if they, but they're not going to evaluate your science based on whether anything except one key experiment or something was well substantiated. So I'm not saying don't talk about controls at all, but you have to really pick your battles and only talk about key things. And then the central point, whatever it is, has to fill the slide and has to be limited to only things you talk about. Okay? I learned this a long time ago from a guy named David Baltimore, who was then later president of Caltech. He said, never ever show anything you don't talk about. So that means putting covers over the parts you don't want, or cropping, or whatever. Never show anything you don't fully explain. Because it irritates people and they won't pay attention to what you are talking about because they're trying to figure out the other parts on their own. White space, okay? Here's a coworker of mine playing with his microscope. Why make him into 
hobbit size. You know, why not actually show something people can see? So it's very simple when you're preparing slides, go through all the slides and look for white space. And when there's white space, gracefully fill it, not stuffing things in. Never more than four panels per slide, never more than four panels per slide and make things as big and clear as possible. I mean, you want them to see something. What is it you want them to see? You know, the optical bench or his glasses, which are very fashionable. You know, what is it you want to see? Then, the easiest thing to do is to explain something that's fairly well known. You grab something out of a textbook and show it. And it's not quite, apart from copyright issues, which you can largely ignore, I find, as I am today. Um, you can steal stuff, but often it's not quite on target for what you really want to explain. And even somebody who's inept with graphics as I am can make diagrams that will get across a fairly simple idea more clearly than without the diagrams. Okay, So here's an example of one I made. So here's a bunch of cells in a developing embryo. They're all the same. And we want some signals to go between them that tell cells what to become, what kind of cell to become, muscle, nerve, certain kind of muscle or nerve or whatever. So it turns out that in this situation, one of the cells often becomes a signal generator that controls the fates of the rest of the cells. So we make a diagram that shows the signal, which is a protein, emitted from that signaling cell and going out to the others. And in this sort of diagram, it's obvious that this cell right beside it gets lots of signal. This cell out here gets a medium amount, and these cells out here get none. Okay? And the cells change what their fates are to become different kinds of cells based on how much signal they get. Okay? So those of you who aren't developmental biologists now know a very fundamental aspect of basic developmental biology. This is how you make different cells. And you can have a diagram that emphasizes the different fates of the cells. Okay? I think it's a reasonably good example of how to make the simplest possible diagram to give one idea which is a graded signaling effect across an array of cells. And you have made all sorts of diagrams. You want to look at every one of them and take out everything you don't need. I could have shown a lot more about the receiving apparatus, the genes turning on and off in the recipient cells. There's lots more stuff going on, but that wasn't the point of this diagram. All that other stuff is extraneous. It's all side issues for the purposes of this explanation, which is the idea of a graded signal. So distill your thoughts cleanly, find out what you want to say, and make one clear point. And then if you want to talk about how the signal is received and interpreted, that's a different slide or a different set of slides done with bless you done later. Okay? So three examples I just gave you. One of unreadable text and too much. One of tiny figures, two versions of that, one an image, one this, and the other about designing diagrams that have a single clear message. Don't try to use slides for five different purposes. At any given moment, the audience should be thinking about one thing, and that's how these cells become different. Not how they process the signal, not how they send the signal, but how they become different because of this thing. Okay? All right, so a good job talk should have some sort of clear layout, which I haven't done very well today, where you might show at the beginning sort of, listen, I'm going to talk about these three things in this order. And so at any given moment, the audience is sort of with you on here's where we're going, here's what we're trying to do today, and I'm going to spend the last third of the talk talking about my future plans, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's useful. Notice I say at the top, can have. There are lots of different ways to do this, but here's some. First of all, if they don't care about this area of work, the rest of the talk is totally pointless. You could just stop and go home. And some of them will know already why they care. That's not who you're talking to, or except to reinforce them. You're talking to the people who are curious about it. They may have some interest. You want to persuade them this is the best thing they've ever heard about because of this fascination and that fascination and this prospect. And if it has potential applications for medicine, for agriculture, for whatever it is, you say so. For material science, you say so. 
And he said at the beginning, because what's the point in explaining later why they should have been listening for the past hour and weren't? Right? It has to be one of the first things they hear, why does this matter? And then zooming in, why does this particular project matter? Why is it a good choice to approach the central goals that you've laid out in describing the field as a whole? What's your place in this? Why did you do this? Why didn't you do something else? Or there were two possible approaches I could have taken, a theoretical one and a laboratory one. And I decided to do this, or I decided to combine them. It's a 10,000 foot view of the decision process about why you chose the approach. You're also showing your sort of leadership, your command of it. You didn't do it because somebody told you to do it. You did it because you looked at all the possibilities yourself and you made a decision, a conscious decision about the approach. That's probably a good moment to pause and say you were not telling them usually the history of your work. As you know, scientific papers are all fiction in terms of the actual order of events because, you know, things didn't work and you tried this, you tried that, you did them in the wrong order, you found something, you went back and filled in and found out totally on the wrong track at the beginning. That's the way science really works. You don't tell it that way unless you're writing a book about the history of science or unless you want to drive your audience insane because it's not that interesting to most of them unless there's something very funny or some amazing coincidence or some wonderful human story to tell and then he could do that. But in most cases, you restructure the history to fit a nice, clean story where you say, here's where the field stood, here was this fabulous central problem it was impossible to approach before, and now we have this new idea of how to approach it or this new technology, and I'm one of the first to do it, and here's what we did, and here's what we found out. It should stream in a nice, logical fashion. And it might involve a novel approach. It might not. And you can give some drama to it. Obstacles overcome. You know, I was tearing my hair out, you know, I especially can say that, uh, to try to overcome this thing that, you know, had stumped all these other people. We didn't know what to do and we changed this filter and lo and behold, you know, whatever. Okay? Now, high energy may be an element of surprise. Anybody I know who can give good talks is always nervous at the beginning of them, as I was today. Okay? And that's because you care. You care a lot. Okay? And so what do you do with that? Well, first of all, you memorize your first sentence, because that's calming, but no more. You certainly don't read anything to people. And the second thing is you use your energy and the audience's energy uh, to sort of set that stuff aside or exploit it in a way. The nervousness turns into some good energy for speaking to the crowd. And this is something where your friends' feedback and practice talks can pay off a lot. In theory, we could watch film of ourselves speaking. I have never done that for more than two minutes because it's so horrifying, <laughs> it's a personal experience, that you just cannot bear to do this. Do it if you can, but the next best thing is obviously to have some friends sitting around saying, you know what, I, I think it would help a lot if you did the following instead of what you're doing or, or in addition to what you're doing. So having energy, I mean I could stand here and I could talk about this for a little while and I could take everything I was saying to and it just isn't a good idea because no zero modulation of your voice and something that's basically designed for libraries is not what you're after to convince people you're going to be a great speaker and a great teacher because it's not very interesting to see someone standing there. It looks like you're about to die. <laughs> so don't do that. Modulate your voice. There is theater in this. There is theater in this. And I'm not perform, I'm not theatrical, but you can do some simple things, including just move, I'm not moving very much, but I'm moving a little, makes me feel better because I hate standing in front of these things, and you just, you know, you're showing some signs of life, okay? There should be some new results 
somewhere that are clearly explained and you have to comment again, don't leave it to your audience to figure out that they're new, to figure out that they matter, to figure out how they matter, you have to tell them. Don't leave it to chance. Don't leave anything to chance. Remember how tired you are when you sit through lectures. They're just as tired of it as you are, and you have to help them, even if they're sitting there with a newspaper on their phone. Now, this, although it's just one point at the end of this slide, it's really important. At some point, if you want a job, you stop and you tell them why they should give you one. Here's all this stuff, I've just explained it, doing all these things, and now I can do lots more. Some talks I've seen, I've seen a lot of job talks, people devote four to five minutes at the end to that, which I think is a terrible missed opportunity. There's probably some difference of opinion on this. I don't ever like to let things speak for themselves, and so a substantial in italics vision of the future where you show not only what you plan to do, but why it's important and why you have a competitive advantage and why you're going to get grants to do it if that's involved and why you're going to bring something special to the department and who you can imagine collaborating with that department and if it's an academic setting, what your teaching plans are should be there. That'll astound people at research universities who will be amazed you're even thinking about the teaching process and you should. It's good to surprise them and so on. And I'd say at least a quarter of the talk. So if they give you 50, 55 minutes, you're done with your research presentation at 40 minutes. Okay. And you can think about how to structure that. Then there are things you don't want to have in a good job talk. One is an expectation of massive prior knowledge. If you're a biologist, you can expect people to know the structure of DNA how it's copied to some degree, but you're not going to expect any specialist stuff. Jargon is a plague. We all know that. We slip into it easily because we're trained to, because it's a shortcut for us. It's a catastrophe for talks, even to specialists, because the, there's so much struggling with the language and does this person who's speaking mean what we mean when we say that, you know, and what's a whatever. In biology, for example, it's amusing that two of the commonest words used in biology, gene and species, are both ill-defined. It's very difficult to define what either of those is. Okay, so you want to be very careful about language, and you want to have a strong allergic response to jargon. Anytime you can eliminate an acronym or some other jargon, you should. And this is where having your friends who are not specialists in your field listen to you is a huge advantage because they'll start giggling when you do it. You know, here you go again. A ton of data now. So I've seen people give job seminars where they're trying to blow away the audience with how much data they have. I've never seen it succeed. This happened a lot in the early days of genomics researchers where you suddenly have more data than anyone had ever seen. Instead, the data should be digested for the audience, made palatable. And you can indicate that what you're showing is derived from some vast sky survey or something. But it will not impress people simply to say, to sort of strut around saying, well, I have a computer and I can look at you know the whole Sloan survey or something. That's not a good way to gain eminence. Interest for only part of the audience. This harkens back to something I said earlier. You can do this a little, but you're at great risk if you do this a lot, because the people you're not talking to who don't care about the little specialty side issue you're mentioning, you've lost. And you're going to have to work to get them back, because they're irritated, and they're busy, and they have a phone on their lap. Okay? So don't lose them in the first place. Why do it? All right? Try to maintain the interest level, the story. This is about storytelling, right? Similarly, you don't want to show all the work you've ever done. You might well want to comment if you're a postdoc, giving a job talk, you might well mention your graduate work. That's fine to do, but in a summary fashion, shows maybe the breadth of your experience and why later in planned work you're going to bring into the work stuff you're not doing now as a postdoc, 
but could call upon in a way from your graduate experience. That can be a good thing to do, but be selective and be thoughtful about not overwhelming your audience. Okay? And this I've already said about seven different ways. Do not expect the audience will see the implications of what you just said. Finish the sentence. I found out that such and such and such and such and such and such, and therefore, that idea I told you earlier was wrong, and instead, this. Okay, take out the, the last part of that, and all you've said is, see, this is the result of the experiment. And you're expecting them to notice that the idea you presented earlier was wrong, because you, that's how you sort of set it up. But they don't, they're not quite with you, they're scrambling, they're trying to absorb it, they're looking at slides. You don't want to make them work so hard. They resent it, they should. Poorly answered questions, either during the talk or after the talk. I'll do some of this later, I'm sure. And this is something where, you, especially at the end of a talk, you're tired, right? It's exhausting to give a talk. So at the end, you have to somehow muster enough energy to really focus on what someone's asking about and decide how much you want to twist their question to your own purposes, because you're allowed to do that. You want to be courteous in responding to them, but you may have something really cool to talk about, and what you would talk about only in answer to the question is actually sort of boring. So you say, well, here's the line of thought about that, but let me tell you this amazing experiment. And suddenly you've, you've enriched the experience for the whole audience. Okay, and the, these last things, casual, sleepy, boring, low energy attitude, fatal to any talk, you have to be energetic. You have to engage with the audience. You have to make eye contact. Uh, you can get, I mean, people have been hired who, you know, mumble through an hour, but it can't help you, right? It's despite them rather than doesn't. It? Now, I want to make a few more comments about slide design, sort of relate to some of these things. And this is one of the commonest issues, and I've violated the principles today that I'm about to tell you, because I've been showing you things on the slides that I was saying. So what were you supposed to do at that time? Were you supposed to read them, or were you supposed to listen to me? And the only thing I can say is that most of those slides had like this, roughly one line on them, or two lines of text, very little. So the answer is you could do both. But in many slides, especially with experiments and so on, if there's text and stuff, there is a direct conflict. You are setting up your own competitor in front of the audience, and you're fighting yourself for attention. So you have to decide. Do you want them to read, or do you want them to listen? This says, for my presentation today, I'll be reading the PowerPoint slides word for word, which is very commonly done. It's like a prompter. Well, I think most of you, I'm sitting here can't lift this up because I'll disconnect some wires, but I have the next slide showing on my laptop, so I know what's coming. I have my prompter. It's a fabulous crutch. I love it. Okay. I know what's coming next, and I don't need to wait till I see the slide to introduce it, which is a terrible style of thing to do, where you wait, you try to change the slide, and oh, oh yeah, you know, now let me introduce it. And then they're not listening to you because they're already looking at the slide drive figured out on their own and you've lost your audience. So what you want to do is introduce the next slide before you show it. And then when it comes, people have the foundation for it and will pay attention to it. But going back to this point, do you want them to read? Do you want them to listen? Which is it? So if you want them to listen, you can't show anything interesting. And you can't show a lot of text because the only way you'll pull the attention away from there is if they've already seen it and they're bored and now they're going to listen to you. Because there's nothing left over there. They've exhausted the potential over here. Because you know, you all do this, right? You see a fresh slide with all sorts of stuff on it, you start studying it and your attention drifts away from what the speaker is saying. If, there's, if you as speaker want that to happen, then stop talking. Let them study it. Take, tell them what to look at. Say, see that yellow thing up in the corner? That's really amazing. And in a moment, I'll tell you what it is. Look at it. You know, that kind of thing. But don't talk over it, because then you're competing. I already said, my, I think I already made these points. So, all right. 
So this one, so you're looking at a totally pointless slide. I just love Yosemite. So I'm going to start talking about this is my cue kind of to get as quickly as possible to keeping a job and, you know, you know presence in departments and then answering your questions. So you will look at this for a little while and stop listening to me, depending on your level of interest and where the picture was taken and how you hiked to that point, which is not on a trail. Uh, you're figuring out your next hike or whatever it is, that's fine. But when you're ready, could you uh, let me know and I'll resume my talk. So, anyway, no, I'll keep going. So, but I'll leave it up there so if you don't want to listen, you have something else to look at. Um, okay, so let's say you get through this interview. You give a wonderful talk, you visit with people all day long. It's a very tiring but really quite exhilarating process because you have, say, a dozen senior scientists and junior scientists explaining their work to you as a colleague one-on-one. -on -one. They're interested in you or you wouldn't be there. You're interested in them or you wouldn't be there. It's fun. And you have a dinner and you have lunch and stuff. And by the end of the day, you're ready to crawl into a hole because you don't want to talk to anyone else ever again. But hopefully, you've kept your energy level high enough. Remember to eat well the day before, sleep well the day before, and all those things. And don't gossip on the way to the plane. I already said that. <laughs> Very important. And now this faculty, let's talk about academia. This faculty committee is going to make a decision about who to hire. And they've got several candidates, some of whom ruled themselves out by giving horrible talks. A lifetime of work, essentially, coming down to a one-hour failure. That it's just so sad. Okay? And it happens a lot. Then there are others where the talk's perfectly good, but then the debate rages among the search committee members, who do we want the most, okay? And they will decide on somebody, by whatever mixture of bias, politics, and data, and make an offer, and they, you know, then the chair or whatever, or department head, or whatever it is, will negotiate some deal. And at that point, you're waiting to hear if you have more than one offer because you want to be in a position to negotiate if you can be. And if it's not absolutely perfect, and very few jobs are absolutely perfect, then you'd like to wait till the returns come in. And they will tell you, you've got two weeks to decide because we have this other person waiting in the wings. Now that's a bluff, and you should recognize it as a bluff because it was so difficult to get the faculty to make that decision that they are really vested in it. And you can drag it out for months because they will not want to lose you. And you can drag it out long enough till you hear the returns on some other thing. Once in a while, it's not a bluff, but the vast majority of cases, I know I, I as a department chair, I bluffed all the time, um, and so does everybody else. So ignore this and instead do substantive negotiations about set up packages, teaching responsibilities, uh, who supports students who come to your lab? Uh, you know, what sort of freedoms do you have? What does the team look like? Uh, how do you get football tickets? You know, whatever it is, there's a lot to talk about. And it's good to be, to not talk about lump sums of money for setting up a lab or something. It's much better to have specific lists saying, I need these items, I need access, frequent access to these items, but don't have to have them within my lab. And I need occasional access to the following types of facilities. So three lists. I know this applies to some of you, not all of you. And then instead of talking about some lump sum, like I want X hundreds of thousands of dollars, you're talking about specifics of, let's not talk about money, but I need this spectrophotometer. Where am I going to, it's essential to my work. I'm happy to share it. Where is it? And then the, whoever you're negotiating with has some very concrete things to go shopping with where they talk to other faculty and say, we can't afford to buy one of these for so-and-so, but is there one around here someplace we could get access to or something like that? So there's work going on to, to make it possible for you to do the kind of work you need to do, uh, but it also is stalling in a useful way because you're waiting to see. You're also negotiating with something else and you're waiting to see answers of things you haven't heard about yet. Anyway, if this all works out and you say yes and they say yes and you show up in the job, then the next part is keeping the job. And again, 
It's thinking about your audience. It's just a different kind of situation. So going into your office or lab and slamming the door closed in order to concentrate is self-defeating because you're cutting off your new colleagues from yourself and you're missing out on chances for them to help you because they want to welcome you and help you and share and things and you're sending this message of leave me alone I'm going to work like a hermit and this is a bad beginning so you want to find ways to team up to do a project together to do some teaching together to be on committees together to have lunch together it doesn't matter but systematically start to build relationships good relationships You'll build relationships regardless, <laughs> but it's better to build ones you want um, with, your, with your colleagues. And then think about this business of can you play a role in your department where you do a certain task very, very well, and they come to rely on you for that kind of service. In an academic setting, you're evaluated according to research, teaching, and service in that order, most typically, if it's a research university, and in the ones where research is really the mainstay of the enterprise, uh, the research outweighs the others. It's not even at all. In fact, it's much less even than I think it should be, but that's the reality of it at this point. In a company, it's a different situation. I think you'll be judged an awful lot in your ability to be part of the team, to interact well with other departments, to allow the company to produce its product, to be creative in those ways, uh, and to bring kind of energy to new approaches, new technologies, recruiting new people. If you're great at that, that's a very valuable thing for a company if you're good at recruiting, uh, all those things. So those are the kinds of things that help you. In an academic setting, of course, you're judged a lot on what you publish companies it varies uh, but you do want to think about that and you do want to make sure if you're part of a large team which can often be helpful that you make very clear to your colleagues what part of the work was done under your leadership you have to lead something you have to define some part of it that you are leading because if you look like a cog in somebody else's project uh, that's not so great. Uh, years later, after you're tenured or something, it's, that sensitivity disappears, becomes kind of silly, but it is true that for new assistant professors, you have to have some papers that where you clearly led your biology would be last author, senior author, in some other fields, first author, but you have to show that you are the driving force in something and make sure that's part of what you do. Uh, Another element of success is your recruiting of coworkers, whether they be employees like technical people or they be computer scientists who come and work with you um, to do something that is not primarily computer science, or they're graduate students or postdoctoral fellows. And at the beginning, it's sometimes tempting. You're so grateful to anybody who shows interest in your work that you tend to grab the first person who comes in the door or the first five and say, great, I'm so relieved you're here, please go to work. And then you either get overwhelmed because you're taking on too many people and you're not experienced supervising them, or you're letting in some people who are actually difficult personalities, which is the most poisonous thing that can happen within a lab, uh, or people who are not that effective for whatever reason. They don't get that much done, they're not very motivated, whatever. So especially at the beginning when you're most inclined to be just incredibly grateful to anybody who's willing to come work with you, be very selective and wait for somebody where you feel the personal chemistry is good and the person has a good track record and you think they're going to make an important contribution. They don't have to be mature scientists, especially if it's a student, but you have to. If you have queasy feelings about a person's attitude, personality, listen to those feelings. They're rarely wrong, okay? And it's so important for both people to try to get it right. So that's very important. And then uh, administration, that kind of stuff. Here I am, an administrator now. It's uh, 
feel somewhat strange after 30 years of running a lab, which is a little bit of administration, but certainly more engaged with the science. Uh, when you're starting out, you want to say no to a lot of things, especially committee work, especially excessive uh, non-job, non-directly oriented tasks, and you want to be selective about the tasks you do. So there might be a committee that actually does something useful. That's been known to happen in academia, for example. It happens occasionally. And then it's good to try to get on to that one because you can use that one to fend off all the others. If I'm very busy with the admissions committee and terribly sorry, I can't be on your bullshit committee. <laughs> such such. Um, that's probably not the best phrasing. But the, you know, so be selective. Look for something that you actually have some inclination to do, and then use it to fend off duties you don't want. And with teaching, it's much better to do a course that's really exciting to you and exciting to your students, rather than doing a course that is drudgery. And getting to the point where you have that choice is tricky, and, and you have to sort of look for your chances. But it's often very helpful if you're new at it, which most assistant professors are, to work closely with a senior faculty member, do a course together, and watch what they do and steal all their slides, right, as a starting point. So that really can give you a head start. In fact, you can often find a friend at another university who has the perfect set of slides for the course you want to take, and then you get theirs. Often people are quite generous with this, and start from there, and then change it to make it be you. But look for these chances to do things more efficiently, try out novel teaching methods. My last couple of years of teaching, I've done a freshman evolution course, which is the most fun I've ever had teaching, uh, about 40 students each year. And we tried clickers. I hadn't used clickers. You know, it's instant polling of the students. It was really fun. Because you'd ask some question that had no real answer. It was ambiguous, and you get some split. And then you talk about, you do the vote. And then you have the students talk to each other about the vote and argue and see which way opinion would swing as a result of them discussing the problem and so on. It was, it was quite interesting. Good. Everybody's paying attention. Everybody's engaged. And uh, sometimes surprises come out. <coughs> that sort of thing. OK, so I am going to stop there and be happy to answer questions from anyone. But uh, I hope at least a few of the things I've talked about weren't totally obvious to you. Some of them, I'm sure, were. But they bear reinforcement, maybe. Uh, and I thank you again for inviting me to do this. And uh, pleasure of sharing in postdoc appreciation. We certainly were enormously appreciative of how hard you work and what you bring to the institution. And we're extremely grateful for it. So thank you. Matt. We have some, I think, coming from abroad. Yes, We're here. through me. Through you? Okay. Yeah. How so are you I doing that? Uh, okay. Email. So, okay. Well, I'll give you a first question from Palo Alto. Uh, what are the common mistakes women do in talks compared with male counterparts? The question is, what are the common mistakes women make in job talks, right? Is that the question? Mm -hmm. uh, compared to male counterparts? That's interesting. Um, I am a strong believer in the imposter syndrome, having experienced it for my entire life, including now. And I have found that sometimes male postdocs or students in my lab have an undue level of confidence in themselves. They should have a lot more imposter syndrome than they do. <laughs> and sometimes, conversely, some of the women in my lab seem to be driven more as I am by feeling like I better work damn hard because I'm not as smart as the people around me, which is how I've always felt, okay? And so this isn't really describing a mistake. It's describing some motivation, motivational energy and perhaps nervousness that can, as I described before, be channeled into making it a better talk. And that the, the kind of undue confidence that a male speaker may have, and I, you know, generalizing about these things, of course, very risky and, and wrong a lot, 
Uh, but having a kind of complacency, a kind of casual attitude of things are going to be fine will make the talk by the person who feels that way less good. And so while some, a woman speaking may start out a little more nervous, the talk may end up being much better for the intensity some of those emotions bring. I think it's very important for talks to have emotion. Jesse. Yeah, uh, could you uh, address a little bit the specifics of the format of how you think the future directions should be? I mean, should this be kind of a jarring transition at the end of the last 15 minutes or that? Or can you sort of work it in to the, to the whole talk a bit better? Or what's the yeah. best format? For yeah, so Jesse's asking about the format for the future plans and whether that the specific part of the question was uh, do you save it all for the last 15 minutes or do you put some of it interspersed in between? I, th I think the answer is it's good to do both. I think when there is something where you've done this fairly elaborate explanation of something that's working and here are the results and so on, it's hard to come back and repeat that whole explanation. So it's easier at that point to say, and do you realize what this means? Because now we can do this and this and this, and I'll tell you more about that later. So it's a bookmark in their heads about this is part of your future. You mention it again later, but you've already described it at the moment when it's clearest. And then for the last 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is, where you're trying to decide what to talk about, Number one, think about your audience. What do they care about? You can skew your talk. Don't give the same job talk at every institution because you're going to care about somewhat different things. And in one place, it's going to be more chemistry. In another place, it's going to be more biology or whatever it is. And so you swing it a bit in their direction. But you could lay out, for example, major projects that you would undertake. And if they're ones that may attract grant money, you'd say, here's a project with the following goals. And the NSF funds this kind of thing through this division. It shows you've thought about that whole process of getting money. Most institutions, at least academic ones, want you to get money. It's a different situation, obviously, if you're in a business or you know biotech firm or something. It's, you'd shape it differently. You'd show how your knowledge of some technology could be applied to their kinds of products. And you'd tell that story then in that situation. Uh, but you'd like there to be some degree of punchline. You want to end up, you don't want the end to sort of drop in tone where you talk about less and less important things. Oh, I suppose I can do that and that and that. And it just sort of fizzles. So you want to think about what is your major thrust of the work and where it can go. And you want to end with that. So if there's something that's secondary, do the secondary thing first. I like this better anyway. And then build up. But this is really, you know, give it the tone of this is really what I'm most excited about, and I'm going to put, you know, 60% of my effort into such and such. Uh, and here's why. There's the other concern at that stage of your talk is not to give the last 15 minutes of your talk and the 30 seconds you have left. <laughs> yes. Uh, great talk. Thank you. And actually, I, I wish I had seen it. Two weeks ago. I wish I had seen it two weeks ago because my job interview was last week. <laughs> uh, but my question is, how much time do you actually spend preparing talks? How, or, in other words, how do you know it's ready? Okay, so for a job talk, I do at least three practice talks to people. And it can be somewhat the same people overlapping, or it can be different people uh, who might have a different perspective. There are practical aspects to that, so, you know, sort of whoever you can talk into it. Uh, in terms of the amount of time, the more work you've done all along the way in journal clubs you've given or research talks to small groups you've given, if you've been preparing beautiful slides, putting in the effort to make things really polished for those things where it's not essential to you, and by the time it's time for a job talk, you've already got a sort of narration in your head that goes with a certain style of slide that you made. The slide is already beautiful. It's not so much additional work at that point. If all along you've been doing minimalist work because, heck, it's just the folks in the lab, you know, I'll just throw up some raw data, you know, and you can't really see it very well, but here it is. It's a blurry image of such and such. You know, then 
you've got a lot of work to do because you have to go back and sort of start from scratch uh, to get, because you want to show beautiful, clean results. And if uh, you're showing fuzzy, blurry, messy things with bad labeling, it's, it's really bad. So, uh, so it's worth putting in, that's what I try to emphasize at the beginning, whenever you give a talk, put the effort in because it'll pay off and that you'll have a head start on all the talks downstream. Um, and I couldn't put hours on it, but it's a lot of hours. With, with teaching, so if I'm teaching a new course, as I did for this evolution course, the ratio of prep time to lecture time is 20 to 1 for a new course. And I only had to do that once, and then the modifications were not nearly that much time. But remember, this wasn't tedium. I was reading wonderful books about evolution. I was looking through all these materials, gathering pictures of, well, videos of birds of paradise doing courtship displays. This was not misery, although some of it was. But, but some of it, you know, it's really fun to try to construct a new course and, and cherry pick really cool images and stories. And I was incorporating stories about, you know, amazing scientists. Alfred Wallace, incredible man, you know, with his adventures and so on. So it's fun to pull out that stuff, and the resources are so huge that you can embellish your talks in meaningful ways with historical perspective uh, that make it much nicer. Talking about Lord Kelvin and his misestimation of the age of the Earth, Darwin went to his grave knowing that it was impossible in the given the age that Lord Kelvin specified for the Earth, that evolution could not have happened that fast. And Darwin, that was intuition from Darwin, was absolutely right, and they just didn't know about radioactivity that was keeping the Earth hot. So they thought it was much younger than it was. And Darwin never knew that, but he was such a good scientist that he, he knew it had to be wrong. That's, you know, that intuition. So anyway, so thinking out those kinds of stories and telling those kinds of things as part of a course uh, make it fun work, but that gives you some idea of time it takes. Putting these slides together for you was a few hours. Margaret. How do you control your speed? Also from Palo Alto. How do you control your speed? Interesting. Well, practice. Practice. Um, you sense the mood in the room, and you can probably sense it if you're starting to sag a little bit, if you're tired or whatever, or you're getting too bogged down in something, so you want to pick up the energy if that happens. With time, you start to learn how long it takes you. This is another reason to have the real slides prepared. Sometimes years in advance, you know, work you're doing and you're going along and you make a slide and you know how to tell that story and after a while you know how long it takes you to tell the story associated with that slide. And the slide has two animations and a video. So it's not the old rule of thumb of, you know, the fastest, the old rule of thumb with the static slide, no animations, no fancy stuff. In biology, I can't generalize, uh, was uh, at the fastest you could go as a slide per minute. Although I have friends who have done two slides per minute, but it's a different style of slide. Uh, but now, with animations and videos and all sorts of other augmentation, you can't just look at the number of slides. You have to look at what it really takes. And so practice tells you that your, your fantasy that you could get through 60 slides in an hour was absurd. You can get through 35 in an hour of the kind you're actually using. So you just practice and practice until you've got it down. How to handle the questions, especially when it goes out of context or conflict? Yeah, so the question is about handling questions that are sort of off the mark, out of context. Um, you know, you don't really get stupid questions very often. You get sometimes questions because the person just doesn't have the background or something. or or maybe you weren't clear, and you confuse somebody, you know? Uh, so first of all, you have to be courteous. That's the most important starting point. Uh, but that doesn't mean you necessarily have to take five minutes to answer something that's just going to take the thing wildly off. So it's fine to say, 
that's a long story. I think we should talk about that one-on-one -on -one later or something like that, you know, to get yourself out of it. Give a brief <laughs> answer to that. Uh, or you can do what I referred to earlier, which is to try to twist the question to something that you do think is interesting and on target. And if it's interesting enough, even the questioner will enjoy hearing that story. Okay. More. Uh, how do you excite the audience? Usually some uh, high voltage applied to the seats works yeah. pretty good. <laughs> um, how do you excite the audience? Okay, so I like to learn from um, people who know how to tell stories. And you know, the, in, in hearing the emergence of Pixar as a force in movie making, you know, they had this incredible technology, better animation than ever, and what John Lasseter and Jobs kept pointing out again and again and again was that had very little to do with the success of Pixar, that it was about the storytelling. So I think that's a, an important and powerful lesson. I don't think I've done personally terribly well along those lines, but the more you can give some dramatic sweep to the excitement of the work. Here's a mystery. We didn't know how to approach it. We struggled with this. Here's what we used to do. And then we finally had this idea of such and such. And now we can do this. And you know what? We found something that was totally surprising. We didn't expect this at all, right? Like tripping over the wastebasket. So adding some drama, which is often really there, uh, it's absolutely fine, and I think it helps a lot in terms of maintaining excitement. A little bit of a surprise, a little twist. Uh, when, it, when you have it, use it. You know. Go ahead, okay. uh, how do you end a talk quickly when you are running out of time? <laughs> yeah. What you do is you just start whipping through the slides, talking faster and faster and faster, <laughs> which is the worst possible thing you can do. So you, if you've prepared properly, you won't run out of time. If you find yourself running out of time, you haven't practiced enough. You should know to within 30 seconds how long it's going to take you uninterrupted to get through a talk. So then the only wild card is unplanned interruptions. So you have to leave some leeway for those, one or two minutes. Um, but let's suppose you screw up. And you're out. Of, you know you're going to run out of time. The hardest thing to do often in giving a talk is to stop and not say anything. It feels like a vacuum. It feels embarrassing. I've got to keep talking. I've got to keep talking. But instead, you have to look at the clock and say, "This is not. Good. I know how much I have left, and it's 20 minutes, and I have 10." You have to stop. Stop talking so you can think. Figure out what important things you haven't said yet. Because something has to go. And there's usually a message or two that's really important. And I'm just talking about the science now when we come to, you know, you certainly don't want to chop away the part where you talk about your future plans. So if you find yourself up against that, you have to stop with the science and talk, or at least the director the reporting of new science and talk about your future plans right away. So that's kind of easy because you just snap to the, the last part. But even before that, you may want to truncate the research part by saying, I realize in order to leave time to talk about my plans, I'm going to have to chop something out here. And then you don't have to do a lot of commentary on it. You just flip past a couple of slides to make the main points. But the hard part is stopping to think, because there's such a strong compulsion to not leave that silence in the room even for 30 seconds, which is usually all it takes. So that's that's my recommendation. Steve has a comment. Matt, how useful do you find it to uh, know your audience well enough so you can anticipate their questions? Like, if you're going to a university, you have a couple experts in the room, they might overlap the area that you're new in research. Um, do you go to the lengths of Yeah, 
that's great advice. I mean, I, I could almost let Steve's, I should repeat your comments so people can hear, but you said, uh, in some cases, you will go to give a talk somewhere and you'll know some of the audience members, or you'll know of them, you'll know of their interests, you'll know of what they published, you'll know of their opinions on certain scientific matters, and so you can anticipate questions they are likely to ask you. And like, what's Jerry Mossberg going to ask me when I go give a talk at Caltech? Right. Not much so, anymore. So <laughs> it's... <laughs> when he was alive, that was... So scary. it's... <laughs> when he's alive, yeah, he asks more. Um, it, it is very good to do that kind of preparation and to be ready with an answer, particularly if it's a delicate situation where there is some scientific uncertainty and you're on different sides of the thing, and that's a good time to acknowledge that uncertainty and say the reason we have different views of this, it's not settled because we can't measure this and we'd like to measure that or we need more data on this or something. So thinking through somewhat complicated political situations like that is good, but other times there won't be any tension like that. It'll just be that that person has particular interests that touch on your work, but are not down the middle. So you're not going to talk about it unless they bring it up. But when they do, you want to have something intelligent to say about their interests and how it connects with your work. So definitely part of the preparation for the visit to the department. Okay, one last question from the social media side of things. <laughs> I wish I could clarify this more because I'm not sure exactly, but I'll read it to you. How do you deal with climate complicated panels and get them engaged with your topic? Any tips? How do you engage with climate? Uh, that's what I'm not sure of. I couldn't get clarification in time, but how to deal with climate complicated panels? I think. Climate complicated panels. So that's either a reference to something to do with politically fraught climate that's change debates. That's how I interpret it. Okay, so let's talk about that question. And, and so for biology, it might be evolution. Um, I get regular emails from someone who I don't know, who goes on for pages and pages with critiques of current politics and science to me. Uh, so there are plenty of people out there who are interested in these questions. And I think the, the best thing to do is to keep referring back to facts, to data, because it's much harder, it's easy to challenge opinions that seem to be perhaps unrooted, uh, but it gets you into a mess. So it's better to say, well, here's something we measured, and there's only one possible interpretation of that measurement. I mean, so for climate change things, when I talk about something to do with that, I mean, I've been on the glaciers in the Himalayas and the Andes and Alaska, and they're going away. I mean, it's that simple. They're going away, and with very, very few exceptions. And so it helps to at least talk about facts that are not very controversial. And then causes, you can acknowledge the complexity of sometimes finding causes for something that's observed. College, that's not totally settled. Depends what your own expertise is and how much you want to push that expertise into policy uh, or political statements. For biologists, it's evolution. It comes up when it does. So I invite you all to a reception next door in the tube hall, and let's thank Matt again. Okay. Thank you.